Thank you. Thank, thank you, Alberto. I have um, something to say about technology. Uh, you said, uh, uh, you know, I, I'm from Germany originally, and uh, I, I'm the, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm not using any technology at all. Uh, uh, there's a statistic I heard only this week that 80% of German companies are still reliant on the fax machine. Uh, that's basically <laughs> where we are. So I'm, you know, not me though, but, 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 but okay. I would like to essentially continue from, from where Jens ended and, and essentially tell you the story of how that next year's uh, zone crisis is going to happen, or at least a scenario of how that next year's zone crisis is happening. And Alberto asked me to, 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 to to talk about does Germany need economic reforms? Ultimately, the answer to that question and you know, what I think is likely to going to happen will, will give you or will give us a kind of a, a scenario where the mega risks in the Euro, Eurozone lie. And I don't think they lie in Italy. I think they lie in Germany. But let me explain that, that story in some, in some, in some detail. Um, the, you probably heard that the German Constitutional Court passed an important judgment last week. And the ruling was that the budget, the last three budgets of the government have essentially been unconstitutional. Um, now, I'm, I'm not gonna explain the whole te te technicalities of that, that would be very boring. Uh, but what happened in the COVID crisis is that the government shifted, this, after the COVID crisis, the new government that came into power in 2021, shifted the money that was not spent in COVID or on COVID to a fund for both the economic stability and a fund for the environment. And, uh, but it took these funds outside of the budget. So it, it, it wanted to return to a, a balanced budget this year, but these funds were relatively large and the court has decided that this is not in line with German law, the Germans have put a stricter law than the European Stability Pact into its constitution, uh, so they can run a balanced budget most, most, most of the time. And what will happen now as a result of that ruling is that the German government will have to do what Italy did in 2011. It will have to find money to save, and it will save approximately 50 billion next year. This is the estimated amount. Now 50 billion, now Germany's a large economy, 50 billion is still a large amount for Germany. This is about 1.3% of GDP. Normal GDP is around 4 trillion, 3.9 trillion. So that, you know, 50 billion is about 1, 1%, uh, 1 point something percent, 1.25, 1 1.3%. Um, the numbers are not out yet, so we don't need to be precise about these calculations because the, the, the government has yet to find, identify the legal interpretation, what, you know, how to interpret that ruling. But a 1.3% austerity at the time when the economy is on the brink of recession and forecast to stay weak for another year will almost surely push that economy into a very deep recession. And with Germany, not only Germany will go to, into deep recession. The experience has shown that Germany drags down other countries with it. Um, Austria is a shadow of the German economy. So are the smaller countries of Central Europe, Slovakia, Czech Republic, Poland, which depend very much on their supply chain business with Germany. So we would expect this, this, this decision to have a very significant impact on the economic performance of Germany in the next year, turning the Eurozone into a highly pro-cyclical uh, economy again, um, and uh, repeating the exact mistake the Eurozone made in the years 2010 or 2011 until 2015, when everybody tightened policy and produced uh, an almost existential crisis uh, the Eurozone crisis at the same time, which was, uh, in, in you know, my interpretation, a crisis uh, triggered by a fiscal event in Greece, 
but it, it turned into an existential crisis, not because of fiscal policy or not because of the, the fiscal deficits at the time, but because of pro-cyclical tightening. I completely agree with Alberto that this was a, the, the deep cause of the Eurozone crisis that we, that we it's, it's, not, it's not that we had a, a sovereign debt crisis, but how we responded to the sovereign debt crisis. Um, and we are now likely to repeat this error um, the, the fiscal situation in Germany, there, is, there are people in Germany who want to reform this. Uh, so it's not like every, every German is, is in agreement. The history of this constitutional balanced budget rule, the Germans call it the debt break, like breaking, you know, getting, a, you know, pulling the, pulling the brakes on, on, on the expanding debt is a very visual, visual symbol, but it's really a constitutional balanced budget rule. It was carried by a majority of all the political parties at the time. There were very few people who opposed, who opposed it. There were sort of a handful of German economists uh, who said, don't do this, you know, you're throwing the key away if there was ever a crisis. Um, but the political parties were all in favor of it. And in Germany, you need a two-thirds majority, it's the same as in Italy, you need a two-thirds majority in the, in the houses of, in the, two, in the two chambers of the German parliament to overturn a constitutional balanced budget agreement. And at the moment, there is no majority for political reasons. The opposition, which was probably the party that supported it the most, uh, is not willing to uh, accept the change, whereas the government uh, parties, at least the SPD, Olaf Scholz's party, and the Green Party, they support a change, but they don't have a majority for this. So this is not gonna happen. Uh, we can say this with certainty. It's not gonna happen in the current legislative term, which ends in 25. And whether it happens afterwards, uh, I'm not sure. It's usually, you know, at the time for it to happen after you've done the fiscal adjustment is usually not the time when countries do it. This would be actually a good moment to do it from an economic perspective because, you know, it would prevent damage you know, doing the damage and then changing it, it's, it's uh, you know, I, I'm not entirely sure that this, this will carry a majority, but the, the fact is that you cannot do this without the CDU. And as long as the, the debate in that party has not shifted and I see no, no shift in, in the party for the foreseeable future, it won't, it won't change. Now, this will have also an impact on the European rules, because if you look at the fiscal developments in France and in Italy, uh, budget deficits, I don't have the precise numbers, but it's a, in excess of 5% of GDP this year. Uh, forecast to go down to 4% plus next year. Yeah, the, the, precision, the precise forecast I don't really care about because they're almost surely to be, likely to be wrong for an, a number of reasons. But, but it, you know, it, this means a in, increasing divergence from Germany in that period as Germany is now moving towards a balanced budget a real one, now that the Constitutional Court has kind of abolished the cheating, the, the cheating with this, the shadow, the shadow budgets, the, the shadow budgets are now being uh, dissolved and have to be brought into the main budget, um, uh, Germany will, will, uh, will, will, try, will try to achieve a, a balanced budget, um, whereas the budgets in, in the rest of Europe is, is significantly higher. So we're seeing fiscal divergence, and that, that has a lot of political implications. For example, in the current debate on the stability pact, we are in the sort of the final and the final level. I cannot see Germany accepting even a compromise in this debate. The German position was we have to return to the old old rule of the last decade, the three percent and the and the significant uh, annual uh, reduction in in deficit in, in in the debt to GDP ratio. That that position, Christian Lindner will almost surely maintain that position. Um, in those negotiations, and there will be a very significant split in the, in, 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 among the finance ministers on this. So I'm, I'm extremely worried about fiscal divergence and the, and the, and the, you know, and what this does to the willingness of, of, of European countries to respond to a crisis should it occur jointly. My second point on does Germany need reform is on, and it's another, I mean, the, the first one was the fiscal side, and I think the answer is yes, it does need reform, but I don't think it will happen. The second thing, the answer is a little a bit less certain, and the second point is, 
Germany has been what I would call over-reliant on old technology, old industry. Uh, if you look at the German DAX index, uh, if, you, if you compile the average age of the companies, it is the oldest, the oldest age of all companies in Europe. I think the oldest company is 600 years old. There's only one company from this century. The next one was SAP, which was, born in nine, which was created in 1970. And virtually every, every other company is older than I am. And I'm not as young anymore. And um, it's, it's a, you know, the, you know, there are companies like, L Linda just left it, but Linda, they make industrial gases. There's BASF, of course, Bayer, the chemical giants. They're all the car companies. And we all know those companies. They're big, and they have been in the past very successful and very profitable. Uh, and that has been a German, you know, speci speciality, and Germany has, the German industrial model has largely relied on those companies and the so-called Mittelstand, this is the, the, the medium-sized industrial companies. So Germany pursued a political strategy of in, 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 an industrial economy. And everything Germany did was to help the industrial economy. Um, you may recall the structural reforms of Germany in, the 19, in 2005 which was geared towards making Germany more competitive. And that's what, what, what reforms in industrial economies are. It's all about competitiveness. It's all about you know, zero-sum games. It's like us getting better than them. Um, so Germany lowered its wages through a number of reforms that ultimately led to this. It increased its exports. The current account surplus rose to over 8%. Um, uh, in, the, uh, in the last decade, they're still high today. Uh, not at 8% anymore, but it's still unsustainably high. Uh, and that is the result of, of, of Germany being exposed to, to industry. But what happened is that the energy shock has meant a permanent increase in energy prices, even though some of those prices have come down for the German, for the German energy consumers. This is going to be um, the, the the their costs have increased, and the and they will not get a lot of subsidies and compensation uh, in the future because I think the way the government will uh, will you may have they may have to cut some of those subsidies, but if if you think this is actually an important statistic in the German you know they, they have been very desperate to cling on to to the industry. And I remember in 2019, the German economics minister said Germany had already the highest portion of, of industry uh, in GDP of all countries. And the strategy in 2019, that's not that long ago, was to actually increase that, that, that share. It was not enough for them. They wanted to have even more industry in this, in this, in this thing. And, um, and what they did as the international environment became tougher, COVID disrupted supply chains, the war in Ukraine uh, rose, led to a rise in energy prices. What they did is raise subsidies, and it's quite a, a, a startling statistic. I was just looking up the numbers. In 2020, for the 2020 budget, which was drafted before COVID, the total subsidies in the economy was 0.7% of GDP. Today, it's 1.5% of GDP. In, in just three years, the subsidies have grown by more than twice. And for the next year budget, one of the things they're doing, they're giving 10 billion to Intel to buy a chip factory. 10 billion is the biggest single sub subsidy ever paid in Germany. I don't think Italy's ever paid that much for anybody. The idea is not to have a, 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 a semiconductor company in Germany and sort of to discover modernity. The German car industry, the idea is to protect the German car industry supply chain to make the German, it's all about, it's all about cars. It's not, about, it's not actually about the industry itself. Um, the, uh, there, there is an electricity price subsidy to compensate companies from the CO2 pricing, which is 12 billion. Um, the subsidies paid to maintain a model that is no longer competitive, and there's nothing they can do this time. They cannot cut wages again, because that, that was, and the exchange rate is weak. Um, they have basically maxed out what they can do in terms of, in terms of industrial competitiveness. 
and the realization is, you know, is Germany is not a country which is not great for energy. It's not particularly sunny. It's not particularly windy. Uh, you know, Italy seems to be windy and sunny. Uh, <laughs> you, you don't have that much um, uh, in Germany. So, so it's a country that doesn't have the, the natural advantages of, um, of um, you know, for renewable energy sources. It has just decided to, for political reasons that also have a long backstory, to get out of nuclear energy, which would have probably been the one thing that would have been possible for them. Uh, uh, there is now a, a there's been a long anti-nuclear backlash. Um, the, the, there was a recently a statistic in the newspapers. There are only eight professors in Germany left in any sort of physic, physical, chemical departments for nuclear, uh, specializing in any nuclear sciences. And there are um, 160 or so uh, professors for gender studies. Uh, so uh, the, the, the political, the political uh, politics has shifted in Germany strongly, uh, and certainly the nuclear industry is dead. They, the, last, the last nuclear power station was switched off. A friend of mine in Germany, when I asked the question, can they not be switched on again? Because technically that is possible. You know, once, in, once, you, once you decommission a nuclear power station, you could actually you know, switch them back on again with a little bit of you know, effort for a number, number five years. And he says, no, it's, it's, it's technically possible. But in Germany, once you switch something down, it takes about 15 years until you get the, the, uh, the, the, um, the, the courts to accept a license to renew it. It is the bureaucratic procedure and the fact that everything is so legalized that, that it makes this impossible. So even if there was a political consensus in favor of it, it would not be possible now, at least not for another 15 years. So it's definitely not a solution to any energy crisis. So what will happen is a degree of deindustrialization is necessary. What the German system should do, and here would be my recommendation, is to make that, not to encourage that, but to actually accept that it might happen, and to, you know, the, the natural response would be to allow diversification of the economy, basically to take a less, a less, a, a, sort of a, a, a less strong view on what kind of industries we want as opposed to see, well, let's just see what kind of industries we ultimately move towards because you know, it's still a country of engineers uh, and you know, good technicians. Germany has resources. Um, uh, there are ways for them to make money and for them to, you know, it, 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 but, but once, if you force everyone into, you know, if you subsidize the unprofitable sector with massive amounts, you, that means the, the, the profitable sector, the small company upstarts are taxed. It's basically a, you know, Germany has some of the highest corporate taxes and one of the least friendly environment for young entrepreneurs. So there is an imbalance that's going on that is, that in, in my view is quite explosive. And the political system, on, and I see no party, neither on the left nor on the right, that, ha that has a strategy to, you know, to accept a degree of industrialization. They're all doubling down on the big industries. And here I see a big clash uh, coming uh, in the years ahead. And um, I mean, uh, and, and since the German banks are all there to fund the in industries, there is a potential financial crisis out there because if you, Germany has an in industry crisis, it will have a financial crisis. And this financial crisis will be of a, very, of a different order of magnitude than the financial crisis we had in the past. And, uh, you know, and uh, we, we had over dinner, we joked last night whether what, it, what, what you know, would be the next project for the ESM. Uh, and uh, it is quite possible that the next bailout for the ESM would be the German banking system, if this deindustrialization, uh, if this deindustrialization project uh, failed, and that would obviously be an irony, to put it mildly, uh, but it's not something I'm, I, I would not be surprised. Another conversation I had yesterday on the way to this conference with a with a driver, when I asked him. Um, what his experience were with electric cars, because he was driving a large German limousine, and um, and he, you know, he, he confirmed something I had I had suspected for a long time that German companies will, in this new age of electrical cars, 
still be able to man maintain a, a small niche in the upper segment of the market, but not the, not the industry as a whole. Um, a, a very large proportion of the German economy depends on the car industry, much bigger than in any countries, including Japan and South Korea. Uh, I've heard sort of numbers of about 11% of the value added in the German economy is accounted for industries and services that are related to the car industry, not necessarily the narrow car industry itself because it has a huge network of suppliers and, uh, and other companies that service it. Um, th this is a potentially very dangerous scenario for, for an economy that has also become very, very reliant on, on cars. Um, because what happened is, we all know China is, is ahead in the development of the electric car, of electric batteries, um, but also of software. And uh, anyone who has driven uh, some of the either Chinese or an American electric car would, would, would sort of realize that the experience of it is different, the product is different. I always call a Tesla an iPad with wheels, whereas the German car is a, is a traditional, an electric car, is a classic car with a, you know, with a mostly clunky integration of software. Uh, and it's not the, it's, you know, these are different products. And I think the, 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 under, the industry, which is mostly male and engineering based, if you could sort of the culture of Volkswagen, if you walk into the halls of these companies, it's very much a, an engineering product. You know, they may recognize that software is more important, but a software company is run in a very different ways, has different characters, has very different, uh, you know, also culturally very different. And, and it is for that reason that I think the, the, there's going to be a, you know, a, a, reckoning, a reckoning that is the result of, I, I think, arrogance and complacency. I think we've had, we've, we see, we'll still see that, um, that um, uh, both the industry but also the public in general underestimated the impact of the changes that lie ahead. And uh, that is, I still think, while there's a little bit more reality uh, to realism today, when they realized that, that they couldn't sell their cars in China. And one of the, you know, there was, was, was this one anecdote that Volkswagen says, so they were surprised that they couldn't sell their car in China. Uh, and then they found that the Chinese cars had, you know, karaoke machines in every seat, which is something a Volkswagen engineer had never thought of. Um, and, um, and, and, and they also, you know, the batteries last longer and, and, and there are a number of other things where China is also technically advanced, which is something which is very different. This is no longer the cheap alternative. There are actually engineering, engineering problems that, that, they, that they're facing. And also Germany is not a country that will, and I think Italy the same, we will not be very open to experiments of automatic driving in our cities as American cities have, which, which have allowed Tesla to develop a lot of data and gather a lot of data uh, in their cars to develop the next generation of software. We haven't, the world hasn't um, uh, done as well as we thought like six years ago. We're still at a relatively low level of automation, but there is now a, we're now sort of at the brink of the next, of the next level, um, uh, uh, but only in China and the United States, we're not in that, uh, anywhere near that in, in, in Europe. So here is a danger of an industry that is likely, of a shift that is likely to be mismanaged and that will have large, not only industrial and social consequences, but also financial consequences because, you know, you've been, you know, we've been, we've been hearing about the decline of Italian, number of Italian banks uh, in this region and others. The, the Germans still have loads and loads of savings banks and mutual banks. This is still a, a system that's very much tied in to the local business infrastructure. If there are big shifts in this one, I would think there, is a no, there will be a very significant uh, fallout in the, in the financial sector. Which brings me to my third subject, which is high tech. I mentioned the fax machine incident, but there's a lot, this is not just an isolated incident. Uh, when I'm traveling to Germany with my family, there's usually someone in the, you know, in, in the car, my children, who, who say, my phone is broken. And, and uh, what usually is the case uh, is it's not the phone is broken, but that there isn't, hasn't been a signal in, in like for the last hour because we've been driving through a, one of these large gaps where there is no mobile reception. Uh, there's a, a German, former German economics minister uh, told his uh, assistant 
uh, no longer to put any phone calls through his mobile when he was driving in a car because it was so embarrassing for him to have these calls being cut off uh, when he was talking to, to foreign colleagues especially, because going through a German, you know, a, on a German motorway, no matter in which directions you go, you go through very large gaps in which, in which uh, mobile telephony was not available. The philosophy adopted by the previous governments was that mobile telephony should be focused on the big cities, uh, which is obviously doesn't make sense because the whole idea of mobile telephony should reach the parts of the country that the physical infrastructure shouldn't reach. So, uh, but the, the, the priority had been to maximize government revenue and that was obviously better, you know, the, 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 it, was, it was more profitable in the short run at least to have a, a dysfunctional um, uh, a mobile telephony sector. Germany is lagging in virtually all high-tech indices, whether you look at the rollout of uh, optic fiber cables, if you look at mobile telephony, uh, the digitalization of companies. It's not just, you know, I, I would have said that, okay, you're not in the vanguard of producers. Obviously, this, this happened in the United States. The, the big tech companies are not European. But the, the, the second best thing we could have done is use them, use the technology. And in fact, most of the economic advantage of high tech doesn't come from producing things, but from using them. Uh, and to improve your productivity, improve your systems, uh, modernize your company, and that didn't happen. It didn't happen in the public sector, and it didn't happen in the private sector. The, the fax machine is still an example. I mean, this is, you know, this is not only the government's fault that companies have, have fax machines, but so do police stations, so do mil the military, um, and the health departments. That was became clear in the pandemic. The German health offices were not coordinated. One reason was that there wasn't a, they were not connected to the internet. It's quite shocking to see that in the 2020s, you know, the digitalization and internet access is still an issue. Um, and it's a cultural thing because one of the, the things we've had, I mean, you know, I'm, you know, German schools, when the pandemic struck, had no infrastructure for tele, you know, tele-teaching because the schools had resisted uh, digitalization. There's a, 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 a general view among German teachers that, that digitalization is bad for children, which is true to some extent if they, you know, if they, if the kids use the smartphone all the time. I'm not advocating this at all, but there is, there's obviously a need for an, an intelligent, uh, uh, you know, intelligent use of technology in education, just as there's a use of, intellig of, intelli uh, of technology in, in commerce. Um, but the view had generally been by, um, one of the most popular talk show guests in Germany is a professor who has been so anti-digital in, you know, especially in education, that, uh, that you know, he once said when he was asked, is, should children not be able to learn at least how to deal with this? And he compared it as like, like with alcohol. I mean, we don't teach children to be, you know, better alcoholics. And uh, it's, it's a, this is sort of the, the attitude of, you know, if you, if you feel that the modern digital world is evil and you, and you think it's sort of, there's a morality argument in it that, that not being digital is something, you know, puts you on a higher moral standing, then obviously you're not going to embrace that technology and you're obviously not going to reap the, the economic benefits from this. And, you know, Germany succeeded economically uh, in the last two decades for reasons, you know, for reasons that had to do with the, the real exchange rate for real that had to do with the supply chain revolutions. Germany was the big beneficiary of globalization. Uh, but a lot of these trends are moving in a different direction. Now, I'm not talking about deglobalization. I think that word, word is probably wrong. But certainly we are retreating, the West and the East are retreating into their own spheres. There is more French shoring, offshoring, uh, reshoring. Um, there are trade sanctions imposed on each other. The Americans have imposed sanctions on China in a way that didn't happen before. There is a shift in the global, in the global, in the global economy, and Germany is the country that benefited the most from the old system. Uh, it was the fence sitter. It was the geopolitical fence sitter in the world. Uh, it traded with China, traded with Russia. Putin was a friend to the, the Social Democratic Party in particular. Um, but they also try to be in, the, in NATO and, you know, they try to do business with everybody, which, you know, in some sense seems sensible, 
though that was not a sustainable position for a country the size and the importance of Germany. So they have now retreated back into sort of the Western, the Western, the Western fold, uh, which I think is good. However, they haven't got an economic system to support this. And they, the, the, the debate in that country is still resistant to, to this change. And this is where I see um, a, a, big economic, a big economic shock happening. Now, if we tie the two pieces together, my sort of first one on the fiscal side and the sort of the industrial and technological side, it is quite possible that the fiscal savings they make, that they end up cutting the subsidies. That would actually be a good thing. Now, I, I'm not in favor of a 1.5% uh, you know, contraction of the budget. I feel they should cut the subsidies and they should cut the taxes or increase spending on infrastructure, do whatever. Uh, you know, there, there are more sensible ways of, of, of spending the money than on subsidies. Um, so it is, you know, what, what, you know, possibly Germany will be dragged into the sort of modern world. Uh, but I'm skeptical that this will be a smooth process. And if I follow the political debate in Germany and, and see how the trends are going, there isn't really anybody. There are some professors. But in Germany, you know, unlike in Italy, Alberto, economics professors, even junior ones, have no, uh, no political influence whatsoever. The debate in Germany is run by lawyers. And the lawyers have decided, and uh, the decision is very much the you know, consolidation and uh, the fiscal rectitude and it will, Germany will happily drive into what I think is not only an industrial crisis, but also potentially a financial one. Thank you.